Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're going to continue our study. Well, this is the last study for this week, um, looking at judges. And we have a lot of things that we've thrown into the mix that we need to sort out, which I don't think we're going to sort out today, but we'll see what we can do. But anyway, before we begin, can we ask the Lord's blessing? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for these studies uh, that have enlightened our minds each morning. And um, we know, Lord, that uh, as we continue to study, more and more light comes for our feet, but also more and more puzzles to unravel. And uh, we know, Lord, that we need to sort through these things so they can be presented uh, to your people. Uh, clearly and simply, we invite your Spirit's presence here now to help us as we study these lines, that we can understand how these apply uh, to the present, and that we can get a clear picture of all of the lines of the past. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Well, good morning again. Now, yesterday we, or at least I did, put these two lines together and people didn't really object. Um, and, and what we have is we have a seven year period from December 21st, 2012 to November 15th, 2019. That is it's seven prophetic years, 25, 20 days. And, and that's going to, um, be the first week of that 777 days um, that ends on December 25th, 2021. And we're saying that Jotham's parable covers that history. Um, and the history is really one of um, an unfolding of light in opposition to a message that had been uh, seeking to overtake the movement and that those messages would be uh, the various oppressions that were occurring. And, and so we can understand how we look at the, the oppressions and the judges relating to that history. And then we get um, to Abimelech and Abimelech, of course, he's going to, rule for three years, but we're going to take his downfall as, um, as occurring in that three-year period. So it's, it's really his rule and his downfall that's being illustrated there by the 77, 777 days. And um, the idea that we could put these two periods together comes from Leon and Rachel, Plenty and Famine, um, the 270 years, uh, one beginning with Manasseh's captivity, the other with Daniel's captivity. And we also have uh, the period that begins with Jehoiachin's captivity that ends 140 years later in 457. So we have all of these different uh, structures, and there's probably more. I mean, other places where uh, seven years are followed by, or seven days are followed by seven days. Um, and so we can see that the seven years is representing the 777 days. We also, of course, have the 1,764 years that are back to back, which are two periods of seven times 252, right? So that goes from Abraham blessing his sons to 34 AD, and then from 34 AD to 1798. And so we're saying that this is basically illustrating that. That is, uh, we have this previous history, Joth Jotham's uh, uh, parable, right? So we're going to call that Jotham's line. And, and then you're going to have this um, um, another period, which would parallel from 34 AD to 1798. And this is going to be uh, this oppression, we'll put it as that, that happens 
in connection with Abimelech. And we can see that that would be from 34 AD to 1798. There's the persecution of, of Christians by pagan Rome and then the persecutions of Christians by papal Rome. And Abimelech would be a fit representation, especially of papal Rome, but, but of also all of that persecution that occurs. Any, any of this not make sense, what I'm saying? Or does anybody have questions? So it's making sense to everybody, I assume, since nobody said anything. Yeah, it makes sense. And as I'm reading uh, Judges 9, 2, where, where, where uh, it said, I am your bone and your flesh. Well, Pope Francis tries to identify with, with the miscreant, so to speak, with the, to me, the lowest of the low, the worst of the worst, you know. And this is this is just like a bimelic. Yeah. And 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 of course the idea here is this is a counterfeit because Christ is did take upon himself our nature, but in reality, not in pretense. Right? So this this represents a counterfeit of that. Okay, so um, so then if we're going to try to uh, apply these these verses more more specifically, um, I don't you know this is where I have the difficulty. So if we go to Judges nine. So, so we have this conspiracy. We connected that all the way back to this history, uh, going back to Parminder's Sunday Law prediction and what was going on there. As far as I understand, that's when he begins this conspiracy with Terry Lambert, and eventually Tess gets drawn into that, how that happens exactly and when, I don't know. Um, and then... Finally, you know, we're going to know that there's going to be that rebellion that happens at the end of, of that. And so, you know, 2019 is going to be where all of that from 2018 to 2019 is where that's going to be manifest with tests. And so we haven't put specific dates on all of those years, but, you know, mostly I'm, I'm using this as those dates representing the messages that I present not so much um, what happened with Parminder, because those are illustrated by other lines. So when we get to Abimelech's downfall, um, Jotham is, is going to flee, right? Now he went to Beer, which is the well. Now, I don't think that we can associate, we can say that this is the well of the oath. Beersheba, it's just beer. Um, but at least as a symbol, it does in some ways uh, relate. <clears throat> um, any thoughts on that about Jotham, Jotham fleeing away to beer? In the sense that beer is well and well is like like the prophet, the seer, the eye, right? So in a way, it's like telling us we should be fleeing to the prophetic word and to the source of the prophecies, which is Christ. Yeah. So um, now the word eye is eyeing, right, in Hebrew. Um, now beer has some relation to it, but not really directly. But yeah, so it's it's an eye, so it so we can relate the two in that sense. But I would think it more closely relates to Beersheba, even though it's not Beersheba literally. Um, that it, it brings us back to 
the study of the seven times. And so when I look at, um, you know, my part in this, my part, it, when we come to uh, the end of that history dealing with um, Parminder and Tess, I mean, for me, it's going to prophecy that um, helps me sort out what's ha happening. So instead of the subjective feelings that I have about people, um, I just look at the prophecies themselves. And, and then, of course, we go to a study of those things. So it says now, when Abimelech had reigned three years over Israel. Um, now, it doesn't really say that. Okay, so it says when Abimelech. Now, because, and you can see there that the word when is, it's not an added word, right? It's not in italics in that sense, but there is no word for it. Um, and... Uh, what it says here in Hebrew is um, basically it says ruled Abimelech um, a, a, which means like over or against or whatever it's above, over, upon or against Israel so there's nothing there that says when so this could easily be translated as and a Abimelech is prince over Israel three years, right, as the Young's literal translation says. But even to put the and there, um, um, that is just uh, this, this vav at the beginning here. So I don't know if you can see that. It's the letter vav, right? And, and this is it. You know, we sometimes translate it as in various different ways, depending on how we're trying to put this into English grammar. Um, but it's really just a marker. It, it's a connecting marker, like the word and. And so probably and, if you translated it as and every time, that would probably be the best thing you could do. That would be the most consistent. So so the King James is is taking that prefix to the word um, reign, right, to reign over, um, and just puts it into English as when Abimelech had reigned three years over Israel. And there's nothing there that says that, you know, this is at the end of the three years. So this would be one of my arguments for uh, the idea that this is happening during this entire time. Right, so that, that we don't wait till the end of the three years, that this downfall of Abimelech is, is occurring during that period. Now, we, when we have a line, we remember we have a period of darkness and we have a reform line. And um, what is the period of darkness then? Because it's not, it's not Abimelech, because he's obviously not, um, you know, he's not ruling before he rules. So what specifically is this line about? In this illustration of the line, what, what, what light is being revealed in response to what darkness? Because remember, we have the same period of time, the 777 days has different reform lines attached to it, and each one addresses different darkness. So in this case, dealing with the downfall of the Bimelech, what is the particular darkness? Well, I think it has to do with Judges 8.33 to the end of the chapter where, where the Israel went whoring after the ephod. Okay, right. So... So how, how are we going to then address that in our time? All the false gods that we have. Okay, so there's the false gods. And, and these are the false gods really in our own lives, right? Right, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah, because 
what what this is, at least to me, is that we have a line that deals with this um, jealousy, evil surmising, um, uh, promotion of self, all of these types of things that had infected the movement and really were the whole reason um, we have Joth Jotham's parable, right? Because you're in this movement, in the history of this movement, as long as I've been in it, but especially we see starting to develop in 2012, um, people being opposed to, to Jeff in some way, people maneuvering through um, basically the methods that you would see in the Catholic Church and also in the Mafia, right? This sort of deceit, secret meetings, conspiracies to, to maneuver to get themselves or their ideas or whatever justification they have uh, in the forefront of the movement, which of course is a very foolish thing because either things are true or they're not. And if they're true, God's on the side of them and God doesn't need us to act in ways that are contrary to his character to produce his ends. That is, in the world of the Jesuits, in the world, the end justifies the means. But in the gospel, the means is the end. Yeah, I know the mafias are Catholics. That's why they use those same principles. Um, and so God illustrates always his character in how he acts and operates because he knows that for his end to be accomplished, it has to be accomplished in accordance with his character. And so if we really believe the truth, we can trust that God is going to take care of that truth. And, and through this whole history, that's been my approach. My approach was I study the Bible. If something's true, it will stand. If the movement was meant to promote it, then the movement will promote it. And, you know, and this is how we, we're still operating. We're trusting that God is in control. And we want to be able to act in accordance with his will. Often our human nature wants to move things along faster or uh, resolve issues. Um, but those things we have to be patient for because God has his timing as well. Um, you know, you can't uh, force a flower to bud and you can't uh, um, help an egg, uh, a chicken to hatch from an egg by breaking the shell for it, right? All of those things are necessary. So the struggle that we go through, uh, the patience that we have to endure, the trials that we face, these are all part of God's means that illustrate and lead to his ends. So the cross of Christ, no matter how painful it is, um, is necessary for the accomplishment of the recreation of the image of God in man. And so the movement has been infected by this other spirit, and, and we don't know it, and we, we, we somehow justify it. And, and I understand it. I mean, I understand when we see people teaching error in our minds, or we see, you know, people making bad decisions, or people misrepresenting the truth in various different ways, or people having a lack of understanding on something that we believe to be true, um, that we want to act and accomplish those things ourselves, right? We want to to get this thing fixed and get it moving along and get everything right. But God has see, foreseen all of these things. So, so we see there in uh, the end of this chapter here, now Gideon does reject being made a ruler over them, but this ephod thing happens. Now, um, so, uh, I want to just mention something here, and I, 
but not particularly, it's not something I particularly, um, I, I don't feel completely comfortable talking about it, but this has to do with Jeff. So I'm gonna just um, show you here, share the screen. So this is um, a video that's, that we got the, the Spanish there that was put on it and it was posted on, uh, uh, I don't know if it was the July 18 or the 2520 Facebook page. Um, and so I was looking through this here and, and I noticed that Jeff was talking about me. So this is his, uh, um, the, the, the Dan, Daniel's last vision, part 11. And, and he says some stuff that's interesting here. Um, uh, if you have time, go. you ought to go back into the papers that Theodore has written for me. Uh, written For me, I do better reading Theodore's paper than I do listening to him. And that's probably true. If anybody wants to actually understand what I'm talking about, my papers are much more organized than my uh, speaking. One is I try to say too much, too quickly speaking, and um, the papers give you time to sort of reflect. So... So Jeff is going to talk about um, uh, the book of Ezekiel, the dates in the book of Ezekiel that I had worked out um, in the past. And so Jeff talks about that. Then he's going to talk about uh, the, uh, the Jubilee cycle in the book of Ezekiel. And then he's going to talk about Ezekiel's prophecy of Josiah, which Theodore solved here at the end of the world, and uh, talks about some prime numbers, and um, talks about that 180 days there, the year and a half, um, 390, 391 and a half, so that's 390 plus a year and a half, 180 days, he says. Here, this is the light that the Lord used to get or open up. And don't miss where you go, where to go. It should still be in Ezekiel. Go to Ezekiel 4. So he's just talking about where he's studying this. Uh, so I opened up the passage in Scripture that Theodore was led to open up about Ezekiel, lying on his left side. Um, and then he says, um, yeah, they did this also is the work of Theodore and they didn't, no one in the Christian world understood this about Ezekiel. So he's talking about understanding the prophecy of Josiah. Um, and it's hard sometimes reading this because without the punctua punctuation. Um, there's someone that there's a human being that saw the relevancy of this probably before everyone else who was, oh, it, they answered, they answered not, not a word. Who do you think, who do you, who do you think probably saw it first? Okay, that's the way to say it, Satan advocate, Satan's advocate. I was, was trying to tempt you to say it was Theodore because Theodore was used to see these things, but Satan's advocate began fighting everything that Theodore would contribute Okay, and begin to throw dirt upon all this, and it's there, it's there in their battle cry, all right. And so, talking about the, the other movement, and okay, so that's just going to be the end of all of that. Um, so, um, so the point that I want to make is. It's kind of a, so Jeff, and we had talked about this before, Jeff had um, understood that there was uh, an undermining of everything that I was presenting in the movement, right? And he could see this, especially in connection with July 18th. He could see why people were fighting so hard against this. Now, and a lot of those people were people close to him. And now Jeff made a decision to retire on July 18th. And what was his reason? Why did Jeff step out of the picture after July 18th? What was his reasoning?
He believed that his portion of the ministry was done and that like Elijah, he was giving his mantle to Elisha. Okay. Now, originally, he, of course, tried to give that to Parminder. And then he Correct. came to understand that it wasn't really his to give um, and that he had made a mistake in trusting Parminder. Right. And, then so one of the, and, and one of the things Jeff told me in 2016 that really stuck with me when we were picking strawberries at his place was he was just going through all the different people he had trusted and how they had all betrayed him. And, and he wasn't blaming them. He was blaming himself. He said, for some reason, he always trusts the wrong people. And, and of course, we saw that with Parminder, right? Parminder could uh, manipulate Jeff and, and deceive him. And, you know, the question is why? Um, you know, why does that happen? Now, Jeff also understood that, that Miller had, in the end, been... Uh, you know, after October 22nd, 1844, did not stand on the side of truth, though he is saved, right? Um, in his weakened state, he wasn't really held responsible for rejecting the light that came from the proclamation of the first and second angel's messages. Now, Jeff didn't want to make the same mistake. So one of, so his view was that he should just step out of the picture, Right. But in a sense, he's he he couldn't he couldn't avoid making the same error as as Miller, right? That is, and we we assume that the three hundred and ninety one words um, in five paragraphs um, that Jeff we assume that Jeff wrote those regarding um, Revelation seventeen. Um, definitely, it seems that it could only be Jeff that wrote that. Uh, maybe it's possible someone else wrote it, but I don't know who could have. Um, and, and, and we have here at this time in this movement, we have a parallel to, to Millerite history. Now, there's a couple of things that bother me. So I'd like your thoughts on these. So one is we've had people always claiming to be Samuel Snow. Different people have claimed to be Samuel Snow. Not tons of them, but different ones. You know, there's at least three that I can think of. And one of them, even Jeff tried to attach that to, and that was Tess. Um, and, and part of that was based upon her birth date, November 9th. <clears throat> but... Um, you know the problem. The problem there is that we don't believe that we can we can make a one to one comparison between the people in Millerite history and people themselves in our history. That is, it is. I mean, the only person I could think that we could maybe do that with is Jeff, in connection with his role um, uh, as a parallel to Miller. But even Jeff acknowledged that. In, in some ways, he's he's not just Miller. He's also a person in the movement as well. But, you know, the question is, when we look at Samuel Snow, and I always would be amazed that people would want to be Samuel Snow, in that Samuel Snow ends up believing that he's Elijah, and he goes off in, in other directions. And... You know, so we don't have somebody in the movement here who is Samuel Snow, but Samuel Snow does represent the movement, right? In selected ways. Right, in selected ways. And so we can see that in some ways the movement goes off track, right? But we know... But we know also that there is a truth that survives the, dis the great disappointment of October 22, 1844. And that is going to be um, James White and Alan White, that that couple is going to develop the truths, along with the others, of that end up becoming the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And so, you know, the question is, you know, 
how how are we trying to preserve the movement? I mean, when we look after look at the events after October 22, 1844, if we're going to see a parallel, um, I mean, the parallel that we would have is um, we have different groups. We have the body that would be um, the Adventists who reject October 22, 1844. That's going to be the December 6, 2020 declaration. And what would that parallel in Millerite history? I remember the date. Well, I'm not recalling the date, so. Yeah, so that's, it's going to be this, um, this conference they have. What do they call that? Anybody remember? No, no. They have these meetings. Um, uh, trying to remember. Anyway, they have these conferences that they, they get together and, and they basically reject October 22, 1844. And so we can figure out what that, I just can't remember the name to look it up. Is that the, the Albany Conference? Yes. Yeah. And how do you spell that? A-L-B-A-N-A-N-Y. Okay. So, yeah. So, yeah. So let me see if I can find that. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So this, it, so they had, one of the things they had was the issue of the, the shut door. So the Albany Conference is going to talk against the shut door. Um, so they're going to address that issue. And um, so that began April 29th, 1845, was to be the most significant Adventist meetings in the history of the post-October 1844 Adventism. The delegates of the Albany Conference, including prominent Millerite, Millerite leaders such as Miller, Himes, Elon Galusha, Josiah Litch and Sylvester Bliss accomplished three main tasks. Uh, the production of a 10-point statement of belief, the development of a plan for evangelism, and the passing of a series of revolutions that rejected a number of beliefs and practices seen as extreme, including mixed foot washing, compulsory salutation and kissing, shaving one's head, and acting childlike. So that they obviously reject a, a bunch of errors that were fanaticism. Uh, where can you find this? Well, just look up Albany Conference Millerites um, anywhere. So right now I'm just looking at a Wikipedia page on, on uh, Millerism. Um, so anyway, the, now there is also, there was different groups. Now there was a third major post-disappointment post Millerite group also claimed um, um, so there's, uh, that's going to be, uh, the Adventists, right? Uh, Hiram Edson is part of that group and they're saying here, but there was a group, uh, Turner and Hale. Um, and, and so the first major division of the Millerite groups who had not completely given up their belief in Christ's second advent were those who accepted a shut door theology. This belief was popularized by Joseph Turner and was based on that key Millerite passage, uh, Matthew 25, verse 1 to 13, the parable of the ten virgins. The shut door mentioned in verses 11 to 12 was interpreted as the close of probation. Right now, um, <clears throat> now of course, some of this information might be slightly uh, skewed a bit, but um, so we know that there were groups that accepted. October 22, 1844, but they're going to miss out on the truths that, that God has for his people to understand. 
right? And so we know that within this movement presently, we, we've seen since July 18, 2020, different factions for lack of a better word, right? Different beliefs. And so what survives October 22, 1844, what survives July 18, 2020 disappointment? What is it that has to survive? If you understand my question. Because you have groups that accept October 22, 1844, but they're going to fall away, right? That is, they're not going to be on the right side of the issue, even though they set, accept October 22. And the same would be true for this movement. There are those that accept July 18, but are still going to be on the wrong side of the issue. So what has to be preserved in order for the truth to be preserved? What was it that was preserved that allowed the Adventist church, the Seventh-day Adventist church, to come out of the Millerite movement? So there's, there's light that comes and there's something that has to be preserved. Do you, do you understand my question? No. Okay. So we have groups that accept October 22, 1844, but they're going to go by the wayside. You have Samuel Snow, you have Joseph Turner, and you have um, the Seventh-day Adventists, the, you know, James and Ellen White. You know, let's say those are the three major groups. And even within James and Ellen White's group, there's going to be time setters. So, so something has to be preserved because it's not just the accepting of new light, right? Because Ellen White says that it's, it's the light of the midnight cry that shines all along the path. And so what, what is being preserved? What is giving light for the feet that differs between these different groups? And what would, that, what would be the parallel in our time? Or can we just make, can we, can we see what that is by just making a comparison? Well, wouldn't, wouldn't we look at that more as July 18th? Okay, but there are three groups that accept October 22, but only one of those groups ends up being on the right side of the issue. So would you be placing this then? more in line with Parminder and Tess and then FFA in general, and then those that remain within the movement? Okay, well, FFA ends up rejecting July 18th. So those wouldn't be, those would not be one of the three groups. So, and that's what I was trying to point out is the Albany Conference represents the, the organization that ends up rejecting October 22. But then you have Samuel Snow and you have Hale and Turner, right? And then you have James and Ellen White, right? So Samuel Snow ends up going off. He, he accepts these, you know, that he's correct. Now he's focused upon some particular issues. So he has differences with Ellen White in what he believes. And one is he just believes he's the chosen. And, and that can't be uh, an attitude of anyone in this movement or any part of this movement. Just because light came from Samuel Snow doesn't mean that he must be the one that continues to present the light, you know, as a person. So we're not going to apply that to people. We're going to apply that to the movement Right. So there would be, but, but we have to figure out how we apply that because we have the bigger part of the movement that considers itself the organization. They're just going to reject it. Right. So I place the Albany conference in line with the December 
6, 2020 declaration. Any thoughts on this? How we can address this? It's going to take a bit to really put all this in order. Yeah, I know. But if we're, to, if we're going to try to, because we could look at, well, we have the American group, we have the Canadian group, and we have our group, right? So we could just try to say, well, it's these groups that represent these different uh, contending theories about July 18th. We could argue that. But we also have... Um, different messages too, which I, I'm much more inclined to look at messages. And I think that that's a more wise way of looking at this. Right. Um, so the span between the Albany conference and July 18, 20, I don't know. Angela's asking a question about the span of time. I don't know. All I know is that uh, the Albany conference is going to be 189 days after the disappointment. Um, and I have it as uh, 175 years, seven months, and seven days from what? Albany. Uh, okay. Six. Counting months as like Gregorian months? Yes. Okay. Just as just as the uh, sort of calculator gives it. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um and then the period of time from um from July eighteenth to December sixth, how many days was that? I was just gonna do the calculation. Maybe somebody's already done it. I know I've done the calculation before. Now that's 141 days. So it's a different number of days. But yeah, so maybe that has some significance that we don't see completely. But 175, seven months and seven days. And um, what's the significance of 175? Well, that was the age Abraham lived. Okay. Yeah, I knew there was something there. Okay. Now, um, So we, so we have these different messages, and, and we have to say that there's something about uh, uh, James and Ellen White's message is that first it's, it's responsive to an insight um, that comes from Millerite history. That is, when I look at it, the logical conclusion of what they were proclaiming was the cleansing of the sanctuary, right? Which James and Ellen White are going to understand that what was being cleansed 
was not the earth by fire, but the heavenly sanctuary. And so this, this understanding of the sanctuary in heaven, what's the significance of that insight in relationship to, uh, to what was being taught by Miller? So what's, 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 the, what's the major insight, the, the principle that's being understood? What's the error that Miller's making? Having the earth cleansed by fire as the cleansing of the sanctuary. He's applying what's going to occur after the judgment to before the judgment. Okay. Now, so we know that the earth is cleansed with, with fire, but the cleansing of the sanctuary has to do with sin, not with, and, and in a sense, he's kind of connecting it. But there's, there's a problem with the literal and the spiritual, the type and anti-type there. Right. And when I look at... Um, you know, listening to the different messages that are happening within this movement. So just to be really straightforward, you have Daniel Fontenot. Now, Daniel Fontenot is teaching solid Seventh-day Adventism, correct? Right. Right. There's nothing new there, right? Nothing that we shouldn't already have known. Correct. And, and it's important for us to know those things. So, you know, he, he has a strong focus upon uh, the role of the Catholic Church in prophecy in relation to the Sunday law. And, and what he's trying to do is he's trying to hold on to uh, what we already know that was established. Right. So. So it's good. It's a good work that he's doing in that sense. Now, there's a fault, if I can point to a fault. The fault is, is understanding the new light that's coming. Now, part of that would be we have a fear sometimes because we've been deceived. Jeff has this fear. And I think Daniel Fontenot has this sort of defensive mechanism. We've been deceived in the past. So let's not look at things that are going to sound different or new. And so he's holding on to Adventism and to of the basic truths that Jeff unfolded. Right. So the light that came through Jeff, he's he's accepting those things. Now, then we have and, and I'm going to just put Odilio and Colin together um, because I see their message as part of the same message. So they're trying to preserve uh, not just what was in the past, but also to to receive new light. But this new light is making some of the same errors that we should have been corrected from. Right? So one is we know no time setting. We should know the great disappointment happened. And if we're going to see the parallel uh, to that, we can't now set new dates. Doesn't mean we don't watch and wait or measure the time. But we can't we can't know what events are going to happen. And and even though, you know, there's some good things, lots of good things about what Odilio and Colin have presented. There is this tendency to try to see the events that are right before us as just a delay in what happened. That is Nashville is going to happen. The Sunday law is going to happen. The things that we said were going to happen. They've just been delayed a little bit, and we can use the chronology and what's happened to see this structure, and we should be able to now 
not predict the exact day per se, but know that this is happening right now. We're now in this Sunday law, the Sunday law is imminent. And, um, and that would, to me, would be parallel to the, those who were um, setting time in Ellen White's day that kept looking for uh, the events right before them to be uh, that Jesus was going to come right away, right? Because that's what they were looking for. Now, we see that God has given us great light. And, and then there's a principle that that needed to be understood and that had to do with type and anti-type so now samuel snow applied the type and anti-type in the sense that he he took what miller had said about the 10th day of the seventh month and he lined that up right and so there is a message which is samuel snow's message that leads to october 22 1844 but there still is in Samuel Snow this idea that he's a prophet. And that mistake, the Sam, Samuel Snow's error, I mean, if, if I think about it, in some ways I could apply it to myself, not that I think I'm a prophet, but you know, you look at what Jeff has said about me personally, and the temptation would be, well, so light must come from me. But that can never be the conclusion that we can take. That is, God is not asking us to follow a person. Right? He's asking us to follow the truth. Correct. So, so that spirit of, of Samuel Snow um is a spirit that we have to avoid, but I think still exists within the movement, not so much in following, following a person, but in the self-justification that since God has led us in the past, um, he's still leading us presently in whatever we do. And we have to be careful about that. right? Because we need to be corrected. Now, James and Ellen White in their understanding of the truth, they were to eat, they were, maybe a balance isn't quite the right word, but if I'm going to look at it, um, you know, in some ways I would say that that's maybe the best way. It's, it's a balance between preserving what was done in the past and, um, but recognizing the light that came from the past how that light unfolds. So they're now going to accept the sanctuary message, which was there in Samuel Snow's presentation, but Samuel Snow doesn't follow through with. Right? Because he wants to see Jesus coming back right away. And he's interested in him as a person being this sort of new leader. Yeah, so... You know, we have Abraham as our father, right? Um, that idea, right? So we, we don't, there's, there's no, the only inheritance that we can have is the inheritance of suffering. There is nothing that we can inherit that is going to give us sort of, because um, when you think of, it, of an inheritance, it's like now you've got all this, land and money and and position and so forth but but god is using the weak things of the world to confound the wise and and so what we have seen is that god is god is having us to individually understand the truth and and i know human nature would like to you know have something to cling to that is of the world that is, we would like to have like an organization or a person or something in that to that effect. And and all we really have is the truth. Now, now saying all of that, when I look at this upper room, I mean, I mean, I'm troubled by it in the sense that I know that we have to come to this experience, but we can't force anyone else to do something that they don't want to do. God can't even do that. And um, 
or won't do it. So, so, you know, we won't do it. We won't try to force people to, to look at things they don't want to look at, but we have to look at things in ourselves, right? So the upper room experience is an individual work. That is uni unity is an individual work. And so we've been studying the, the book of judges. And what I think we start to see is that, um, when we get to December 25th, 2021, um, that's, the, that's the period we're, we're giving for Abimelech's downfall. Now, how do we mark that then at December 25th, 2021? If this is a reform line um, and we're gonna have the first and second angels messages, when we get to the third, so I'll just switch the screen again so you can look at that. So when we get to December 25th, because these are just our, our, we haven't put all the dates there under Abimelech's downfall. Um, but, you know, we can kind of know what they are. Um, but we get to the last one we know is December 25th, 2021. The 777 days ends there. So if we've had a first and a second angel's message in this reform line, that different classes have been tested, then um, how do we mark Abimelech's downfall as December 25th, 2021? So part of it is understanding how this downfall is depicted. So how is the downfall of Abimelech depicted? What occurs that leads to his death? Right. So there's going to be all this stuff which we, we can end up putting on this line next week. Right. So and, and we're going to deal with this these two towers. So we got the Tower of Shechem, and then we have um uh Tebes, right? And it's going to be at, at Thebes or Tebes. Um, that he's going to try to do the same thing that he did in Shechem, right? Going to try to, all the people are in the tower, he's going to light it on fire. But a certain woman cast a piece of a millstone upon Abimelech's head and all break his skull. So remember this millstone, what was it? What, what is a millstone? Something that's used to grind wheat. Okay. And this is the top part of the millstone, right? Right. So basically when you have a millstone, you have a stone, and then you have this round stone, and it has a hole in the center, right? And you put the grain in the center of this millstone, and then you spin the millstone, and what ends up happening is the grain ends up coming around the outside of the millstone right? As it spins around. So the grain goes in the center and then it comes on the outsides. And if anybody's ever used a millstone. Now, this is, um, uh, the word is rekeb, and it means uh, a rider that is the upper millstone. Also refers to a chariot um, or a wagon, a vehicle by in implication, a team by extension, a cavalry. So it has lots of Cavalry, cavalry. So it has lots of different um, uh, symbols that can be attached to it. But we're going to attach this to, to Miller, right? To Miller's rules. And Abimelech's head. So Abimelech's head is my, my father, the king, his head, right? And it's going to hit his head and break his skull. But then he's going to be slain by the young man, his armor bearer. Right? So he's going to be slain by a sword. Um, and, and the reason he says this, draw thy sword and slay me, is he says, 
uh, that men may not of me, may say not of me a woman slew him and his young man thrust him through and he died right so so what is abimelech what does it mean this millstone hit him in the head and what does he mean that he's slain by a sword that a woman may not be uh, said to be the cause of his death Well, if if a woman is not to, is not to be seen as the cause of his death, is that symbolically saying that he doesn't wish his demise to be connected with the church? Okay, so so we could make that application that somehow it's it's not connected with the church, but I don't know how we could how we could apply that. I mean, we know that there is this parallel with Jael. Right. I'm not arguing that. And so we're going to say that that has to do with July 18th. And, and this woman uses Miller's rules. So, I mean, if we say it's a church, I mean, he's going to be slain by a sword, which is, of course, usually representative of God's word. All right. But it's the young man that thrusts him through, right? So this young man, um, which is a boy, uh, from the age of infancy to adolescence, by implication of a servant. Now, isn't that also his armor bearer? Yeah. Yeah, his armor bearer is this this boy who carries his his armor, and and he's going to be the one that puts to death um, Abimelech. And armor bearer is um, uh, just means like some to arise is the word, um, and then uh, to prepare apparatus. So he carries uh, the instruments, right? So he's an armor bearer, right? So it's pretty much literally like um, we see the English word, somebody who bears armor. Now, can we say, if we're, we're going to make an application, can we say that Abimelech was slain on December 25th, 2021? That Abimelech came to his end then. I would almost have to think that that would be a good placement. Okay, so exactly what, what caused that? How would we connect that then to, to December 25th, 2021? What exactly happened that would parallel the slain of Abimelech. So we know that Stephen presented the 777 years from 457 BC to 321. So we, we came to understand that this connects us to the Sunday law, which we had as a symbol. And we know that our, our study, the examining um, or, or the, the understanding of the lines is going to begin there, or is it, uh, is it going to be examining the foundation, if it's examining the foundation, right? So we're going to have these studies uh, focus on two different uh, uh, areas, right?
So in 2021, we're going to, um, yeah, so we're going to start understanding the lines. This present study begins on December 26th. So how does that relate? How do the lines relate to this? Well, we're trying to set down the foundation for our faith. I mean, we're trying to carry on with all the truths that we have and establish them and then receive more light. Okay, yeah. So, so we believe that we're trying to, to accept what was taught in the past and that we're trying to receive more light. Now, other people would probably say they're doing the same thing. And we know that Colin presents his study on December 25th. So, you know, somebody could say he's slaying Abimelech there too. I mean, we would, we would look at what Colin is doing and we could say, well, it's a good thing. I mean, there's this light coming from an understanding of the scriptures. I mean, Colin's trying to preserve what was in the past and receive new light for the present. But the question is, are, have we learned the lesson that July 18th gave us? Because we have an overreaction, which is the December 6, 2020 declaration, which is just a rejection of everything. And that's definitely not preserving it. Um, but we can't, we, we have to recognize that there was a lesson to be learned with July 18th. So, so we have a number of things that, you know, had happened even prior to December 25th, 2021, that we should have uh, recognized. Of course, we knew the significance of January 6th, 2021. Well, nearly a full year earlier, we had this siege of Washington, which, um, you know, prophetically is extremely significant. Um, and we've shown how that is all connected. And we had the death of Ashley Elizabeth Babbitt, you know, whose name in Hebrew adds up to 777, plus all of the other uh, things dealing with that date, all the other parts of the structure. So, so we know that we're preserving how we came to understand the dates that we had, and we're placing dates in the future. But those dates in the future, we're not attaching events to. Now, Colin has taken some dates in the future. Um, so he had, for instance, uh, the election uh, last year, and he had placed that as um, and, and made some predictions regarding that. He, he probably would say that he didn't. He was just looking at possibilities. But I don't think that that's how we study the Bible in that sense. Um, but we had the 65 days. So if we counted the 65 days from that November 8th date, we would come to uh, the end, we would say, of his prophetic mirror that he has the beginning but not the end of. And the end would be January 11th, the end of that day in 2023. And so we've seen how that structure all fits together. Now, we haven't heard a lot from Adilio over the last while. I mean, the last thing I think we had from him was... Uh, the study dealing with um, uh, Zebulun, right? That is the, the signs, the, the falling of the stars, the dark day, et cetera, um, the harbingers, which I, I think is an incomplete study. I think there's a lot more to that study than Odilio saw and than we've seen. So if we're trying to make a choice, between different groups, I think we would be making a mistake. My view is that the truth 
is not so much in the factions, but it is something that God has given to this movement that exists with Odilio, it exists with Colin, it exists with uh, Daniel Fontenot, it exists with what Dwight is presenting, um, what Stephen has presented, what I've presented. All of these things are part of a truth, but mixed in with, with all of that, we have within ourselves uh, a tendency to either uh, want to follow man and, and new and sensational things in the future, or we're wanting to be a bit more conservative in the sense of holding on to what we had and being much more leery about any new light. Because I think that the work of each of these people is, is just as valid. What, what the difference is going to be how we relate to these truths, how we understand them, and how they affect us individually. But the one thing I think that I see is that this movement can't exist as an organized movement. That is, we're not forming a church. And, th and this, is, this is a bit of a struggle as far as, not that we want to or organize a church, but the question is, where do we place our, our efforts, our energies? You know, where do we take, um, where do we place our funds? How do we relate to the organized church? Uh, because we have a mission to them, right? We have a mission to Seventh-day Adventists to give a message. And so, so how do we move forward? And, and maybe that's just an individual de decision that each person has to make. Um, right now, Heidi and I are reading in um, Nine Testimonies, and there's a huge section there about tithes and offerings and, um, you know, the misuse of tithes and, and all these types of things and the justifications people have for withholding tithe from the Lord's treasury. And, and you know, and people read these statements differently, Right. Um, some people read it as if, well, you know, no matter what happens, everything, you know, you pay your tithe to your local church and you leave the consequences of what happens with that money to the church. Um, and that, you know, you pay your offerings to the church, you do everything through the church. And then there's others who just feel that they can use the Lord's money in whatever way they see fit, which of course, that's not the case. We know that the the tithe is to be used to support the ministry and offerings are to be used for other things as God directs. And um, those don't need to be definitely even in Ellen White's day, a given through the church. Right? You don't need to give your offerings through the church all the time. So um, the fact that you had an organization that could do certain work, it was often an efficient way and a convenient way to do so. But we have all of these problems facing this movement right now. That is, we feel that in some ways we're like um, at the end of the book of Judges where every man just does what's right in his own eyes. So how do we resolve that problem? What, what is it that I'm suggesting if people could sort of put it in their own words? How can we be organized if we're not organized as a movement? And is, I mean, we saw how that didn't work, you know, creating an organization. Anybody with thoughts on these different points? Well, for me, I'm just trying to follow the Lord as best I can day by day. 
and share with those who want to hear even a tiny fragment here and there. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just trying to be led day by day, uh, try to give so, as much as possible. So the question is, can we be connected to Christ individually? And by yes, that, by, by that means, yeah, and by that means alone, be organized in accomplishing his work. Is that what God is calling us to in the last days? That we are directly connected to Christ, not to an organization. Well, if you're contacting with Christ, then he wants us to be a body, no matter how fluid that body may be. I mean, we're all aiming for the same thing, I would hope. Yeah, and, and see, so wouldn't that be, yeah, sorry. Formality, right yeah. now, it seems that if, if one of us or a lot of us tried to set something up formally, then, of course, we're going to be accused of so-and-so wants to be the head of this, and that's a Tabo thing, or it's a Parminder thing, or, you know, like, I can see that coming, because I've already yeah. heard comments. Well, and, and the one thing is, I would, you know, I would never do that for, for some of those reasons, but also for just the same, for the, but for the simple reason, even if you take all those other things, but what other people think, for the simple reason is I don't think any of us are qualified to be the leader. I don't think God's called anyone to be the leader, right? Jeff was called, right? But I don't think any of us are called to be that. And, and it would hinder the work. At least, at least not yet. <laughs> so, so maybe I'm just, you know, um, uh, um, you know, I'm anti-establishment. Maybe that you could just say that about me. Um, you know, I, I, I don't see every time I've seen men in charge of things. It's men in charge of things. I don't see God at the head of the work when men are in charge, except in rare situations. With Jeff as a leader, I believe that God was the head of the work. Now, Jeff had some personal faults and problems in who he trusted. And people did things to counteract what Jeff was doing. And Jeff wasn't aware of it. But that also was in God's providence, prophetically. But we want to have Christ as our leader. Amen. You know, because I believe, and I believe this you know, for at least 40 years, um, from when I first studied, you know, deeply into the spirit of prophecy, that that's what she's saying. It happens at the end of time. That God is the organizing uh, factor in that final work of giving the message of warning to the world. It's not going to be done through an organizational structure. God is going to take the work into his own hands. Amen. And so if we can recognize that, then we can trust that God's going to take all of these different factions and, and things. And instead of us choosing, you know, whose side we're on, you know, who do we identify with? Who do we like as a speaker or what message sort of suits our uh, natural proclivities or natural tendencies? We just allow that God is in control and that things are going to be worked out. And that even though people make decisions that we don't understand or that we can't agree upon, it doesn't mean that God's not behind those decisions. If we can trust that God is in charge, we can tr trust that he is leading others who may think differently than we do. And this is, I think, what we have to learn from this history. So when we came to the end of our line, we had a number of different things that were happening. And all of those things were um, 
part of God's providence. So now what we, we are experiencing is, you know, after the disappointment, let's say, of the cross, you know, Christ is revealing himself to us. And, and then we come together in the upper room, whatever that means. Um, and that could be even if we're not personally together. If each of us can study and understand uh, our sins that we have done, the things that we have done that has hindered God's work, then God can use us and he can use us in cooperating with others. A spirit has to, our spirit has to change on how we look at our brethren and how we respond to what they're doing. So I'll tell you a little bit of my, my personal struggle in this regard here presently. So, you know that with me, I've, I've been in the health work. So I was at Silver Hills for, for two years. And there we had a health work where um, we dealt with cancer patients, uh, MS, mostly people who had heart disease. That was where we were very successful because the diet that we put people on at Silver Hills and the diet that I was on, um, we had no added fats. All of our fats came from you know, things like sunflower seeds or nuts. And we didn't have a lot of those. And we mostly ate, um, you know, things that we grew. Uh, you know, obviously we would have some things that we didn't grow because, uh, you know, we didn't grow wheat there. Um, we didn't grow rice, but, you know, we ate a lot of potatoes and we grew potatoes and, you know, we all had, we had the big market gardens. We all had our own individual gardens and uh, the guest house had its gardens. And we saw, I saw the health work, uh, the following of God's eight natural laws, the laws of health, um, in operation. And, and also, you know, mostly people came to us if they had cancer, after they had tried everything that the medical profession could offer. So sometimes, of course, with cancer, you couldn't heal people, but you could heal their mind. And you could prepare them to die. That was the work that Phil Brewer mostly did in dealing with cancer patients. But there's always situations where people were, you know, healed. Their cancer went into remission and they lived a lot longer than they were supposed to. I never followed up on all these individual people. Um, but definitely with heart disease, I mean, we saw great results. I mean, people who were popping nitroglycerin tablets, you know, every day. Um, you know, able to go off those completely and have no angina pain within a few weeks, you know, three weeks. So, so I've seen the health work and, and right now they got uh, the guest speaker for this Sabbath that uh, the Canadian group brought in is a guy named Mammon Wilson. Now I don't know him personally. I know he's very old now and um, I've read some of his material. So, you know, so I'm familiar with what he he proposes about health. And he makes some pretty bold claims. A lot of being able to take cancers through the skin. So using poultices and so forth to get rid of tumors. And I'm not saying that those things don't work. Uh, but some of his claims seem pretty, because um, I've seen the health work and I've seen poultices on cancers and, and so forth. And I've seen uh, you know, they can help with the symptoms, but to say that they just remove the cancers completely and the person's healthy, I haven't seen that. Um, not saying it can't happen, but, you know, when I look at it, I see my own natural ideas, right? And yet, you know, I've, I've had to battle with this in my own mind. I mean, the other thing is, I know he's not part of this movement. He's, uh, I think he's part of the free Seventh-day Adventists, or at least they've had him uh, speak before. Um, there isn't a lot about him on the internet other than he wrote a book called Back to Adam. And uh, um, and then he has a, a paper where he talks about all these natural treatments. So I'm not sure what he's going to talk about uh, this Sabbath. You know, what my, 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 my natural thing is, I mean, I actually wrote uh, Kathy Joseph and said, you know, why are you inviting him? I mean, I wouldn't, 
And I know that Jeff uh, was very resistant to um, a lot of the, the people who made these claims regarding health. And so, you know, so, so my nature would be, well, just, you know, I'm not even going to watch the guy, but I believe that we have to be much more open to how other people are being led and trust that God can sort these things out. So even though I have my own natural feelings about it, I have to set those aside. Now, it doesn't mean that, you know, what he's teaching is correct or that, you know, it was right for to have him there, but we don't know, right? We can't just have our own ideas uh, be listened to. If it's true that we can trust that Christ can lead us individually and that he can lead other people, shouldn't we just trust that Christ will work these things out? Even if they go against our our natural feelings? Or am I am I being yes. Yes, yeah. indeed. And speaking of poultice, it's like sometimes when I had the lymph, when I was so so inflamed, so clogged. This is yeah. what I deal with on a constant. I would put the uh, clay, like moist clay on it, and that would relieve the pain. Now I do a lot of bouncing, a lot of movement to keep it going. Yeah. So, I mean, so, these things do work. It's just that sometimes it works really quickly and sometimes it doesn't work that fast. And, and also, I mean, we know that there is... Uh, I mean, there are people who use deceit and in the health message, right? Um, and and they use new age ideas. And so it's something that, you know, we have to be cautious about. But I, I mean, I'm a believer in natural treatments because that's what we used at Silver Hills. And I'm trained in them and I've used them many times. Um, but sometimes people make these claims that are, are sort of unbelievable because... I've been in the health work and I've seen the results and those results I would say are good, but they're not unbelievable. We didn't have people come in with tumors and put a poultice on them and their tumor disappeared. Right. So somebody could say, well, maybe we weren't doing it correctly or we didn't have the right idea or whatever, <clears throat> but Uchi pines around for years and years use the same methods. They are very similar to what we did at Silver Hills and they have, I would say, good results, but not, you know, these type of miraculous results that, that are being claimed. But that's not the point. The point here is, can we trust the work into God's hands, even when it doesn't fit our own thinking? And that we can trust that God will remove people or address the errors himself, right? I mean, obviously, open sin we need to address, and, and we have to address it according to God's word, right? You go to the individual first. He doesn't listen to you. You take two or three elders, right? You go to him. And then if this person is continuing in open sin, then you bring it to the church, right? Not the type of thing where you talk about people behind their back or use, um, you know, we need to pray for this person because he's caught up in this error and you spread gossip and rumors in this pretense of, of caring when really it's just you have jealousy about this person or whatever, right? So God has to change our hearts and then he can use us and then this work can be united. And, and that's what I see in these lines. So, so when we come to this next week, we're going to try to draw these lines out. We're going to give some dates to these and we're going to try to give reasons for taking these events, you know, and, and, and placing them then in in this this history. So we, um, any final thoughts before we close with prayer? Yeah, just I remember Jeff um, talking about Mammon Wilson. Yeah. So I think it was when he was in Arkansas in the church yeah. there. Jeff was an elder. Yeah. And uh, Mammon Wilson visited, and mm -hmm. he wasn't Mammon Wilson. Wilson, uh, he wasn't with his, with his wife, but he is with uh, another lady mm -hmm. sort of going about with her. Yeah. And uh, Jeff, the elders sort of got together and Jeff was appointed to uh, 
to warn him that this wasn't wasn't in God's order, mm -hmm. that he should be travelling with this here woman with his mm -hmm. wife elsewhere. Yeah. And, uh, so he gave that message, but uh, eventually, Marlon Wilson did leave his wife and went and married this year other lady. Yeah, yeah. I think she's dead now, but, but yeah. I just remember that story of by Jeff concerning Marlon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I know. So I know about that because you talked about that before. But nonetheless, even if people have made mistakes in the past, and even if what he's teaching is error, even if there's some deceit. We have to trust that God is leading other people, right? And that um, we can't go by the things that we've heard. We have to trust that, you know, if God is, is going to correct the people in this movement, he's going to have to correct them in a sense individually, right? Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Because God can organize the events, you know, of, of what happens. But if we try to fix the problem, we can actually create more resistance to the truth. Yeah, it makes sense at yeah. all. I know it's a tough one for me because, you know, so, you know, I would, but I don't like to listen to, to secondhand stories about a person. And I don't know what, what's happened in this man's experience since then, right? I mean, people could easily look at things I've done in the past, bring them up, and they would totally discredit anything, any any um, um, fitness to you know to be God's you know servant in any way, right? I mean, they could just say, you know, why is Theodore speaking if you know we, you know, he's done this in the past, you know, um, you know, so. So we could do that with anyone. But the question is, can we trust God that he's going to lead others and that those that are going to go into error, I mean, we need to warn people people about error. It right? doesn't mean we're, we're silent. But we definitely don't step in and try to control what's happening. And so so that's that's where I, you know, um, um, coming to a conclusion that God is going to, that we're going to see God take the work into his own hands. Okay, so anyway, um, let's close with prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for your goodness and love. We pray for this movement. Uh, we pray for the studies coming up on the Sabbath, Friday evening, Sabbath morning. Um, and then the service. And um, we know, Lord, that uh, the enemy is seeking to control us, but we want to be controlled by Christ. We want to have his mind. And we ask, Lord, that you can work in our lives and that your uh, power and glory can be seen um, and that you can lead each of us to confess our sins, and to trust in you. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.